uh, welcome to this class on um, church and uh, ministry administration. Today we're going to start talking about uh, finances, um, the financial side of things, finance, accounting, and budgeting. That's what we're going to start talking about. And uh, so this is uh, an important part of uh, church ministry, church and ministry administration, a very important part of it, finance, um, financial management, accounting, budgeting. So let's take a moment to pray and then we will get started. I'm sure the others will get into the class. Uh, in the meantime, let's uh, pray. Could somebody lead us in prayer? And let's Let me pray. Lord, thank you for this um, another session to learn your word. Lord, as we um, learn your wonderful word, Lord, enlighten us all mentally and spiritually, Lord, with your word. So, Lord, be with us and guide us, Lord, uh, with your spirit throughout this session. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. So, uh, we're getting started to talk about, uh, as part of the church ministry and administration, we're going to talk about finance, accounting, and budgeting. And in this lecture, um, I want to just, just focus a little bit, uh, focus on the biblical side of finances uh, from a church and a ministry standpoint. And um, then the next lecture on, we might spend about one or two lectures, additional lectures on this. And we will talk about all the practical things that we need to do. But I want to uh, help us get a biblical uh, understanding on this. Now, finances uh, in financial management, I should say, finan financial management for church, for ministry is so very, very important. And, um, you know, uh, we will see from scripture that, you know, God views it uh, as very important and his, uh, there are instructions given to us in his word. But uh, also from a, you know, from a practical standpoint, one is we all understand we need money to do the ministry, uh, whether you're whether it's a church or whether it's any other form of Christian ministry, you know, whatever organization or whatever kind of ministry you're doing, uh, almost everything requires money. And we need money. We need money to do the ministry, uh, even to uh, have a congregation to run a church. You need money because you need money to <clears throat> rent your place, uh, you know, buy equipment. If you're having staff, you need to pay the staff. You need to, there are other expenses. Uh, so all of these things require money. But money or, or mismanaging money can be very, dis can be disastrous. And uh, we have seen, and you know, church history, you know, go back in time or even you look at recent history, uh, recent times, uh, big churches and ministries can just crumble overnight because of uh, mishandling of money. Or in some cases, the ministry may continue, but uh, the mishandling of money brings a lot of disrepute, uh, dishonor to the name of Jesus. And, uh, you know, and, and there are just so many, so many examples uh, uh, of course, uh, it's the big ministries that get published in newspapers, you know, but uh, there are obviously small things happening around us in churches and so on, which may not be picked up by the news and so will not, you know, be heard by many people. But the fact is, whether you're a big global ministry or whether you're uh, a small, you know, a small ministry, wherever there's mismanagement of, of money and finances, it's going to cause problems 
and it's going to bring dishonor and dis disrepute. And sadly, uh, this has been happening. It continues to happen very often. And uh, so, all uh, so all I want to, you know, uh, one of the key things I want us to take away from these lectures, and we will do about two or three of these lectures on finances, is that it is so important to be very careful, very careful. You know, uh, one of the things that that I personally, as as a pastor, that I am, you know, very concerned about is the money. Now. The reason I'm concerned about it is because I am not directly involved in it. You know, I, I I don't handle it. We have an accountant, and you know, we have other people handling it. So I'm not directly involved. Uh, I may approve things that are uh, are some of the bigger things, but on a day-to-day -day basis, there's a lot of small, small, small things happening. You know, which I'm not. I I don't even. I, I don't know every bill that's being paid. I don't know every. You know every transaction is happening. I, I I can't be sitting and watching that, and so of course that whole financial side has been entrusted to some other people. But if something goes wrong there, the whole ministry can collapse. You know, and that's why you know I I, I can't overemphasize how important this is. You know, just to give you some examples, uh, practical things. I mean, you know, there there was. And I'm, 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 you know, I'm mentioning names uh, just to let you know that these are real stories, and not to defame these people because people themselves they were genuine, but mistakes happened, you know. And uh, I'm just mentioning some of the stories. Uh, some there's just many, many, many examples. You know, one uh, I think of was a wonderful man of God called Larry Lee. Uh, uh, this is from America, and uh, in the 1980s, 1990s, especially, uh, he was he was coming up as one of the foremost leaders, spiritual leaders in America. Larry Lee, uh, he was he was pastor of Church on the Rock. He had graduated from Oral Roberts University. He was doing wonderful ministry, and in those days, he was uh, a prayer. He was a pastor, but he was a prayer leader for the nation. So when Larry Lee would have uh, prayer conferences, the stadiums would be packed, and they would come and spend hours in prayer for cities. So that was, uh, you know, he was a prayer leader, and he had written books on prayer. You know, uh, one well-known book was Could You Not Tarry With Me For One Hour? And it was a very well-known book, widely circulated in those days. And uh, so amazing ministry, powerful, wonderful man of God, genuine man of God. Um, and uh, like I said, he was a prayer leader, wonderful. He was really causing the church of Jesus Christ to grow in prayer. But something happened in his church, in, in his ministry, church ministry. Uh, people found that uh, you know, the, and the numbers were big, meaning the, the, the his congregation was growing. The numbers were big. I'm sure that like, he himself was like, <laughs> cannot handle all the details. But um, uh, they just showed, you know, um, so, so basically what happened was offerings that were being collected. Sometimes the envelopes were, you know, um, the, the way the envelopes in which people would put money and put it in the offering box, um, they were showed, they, they just showed that, you know, uh, when people put in prayer requests and all of that, the money was taken and envelopes were being thrown out and things like that. So the news media came. They showed this on television. This was what happened. And, and you know, something small like this, yeah, I'm saying quote-unquote small, meaning it is, it is important. I'm not saying it's not important. But I'm saying just the fact that the news media picked this up went on television that this is what was happening. And Larry Lee is himself directly not responsible. You know, this is like how the offering is received. And, you know, he, Larry Lee is not the one sitting and counting the money. The offering is being received. It's being processed by the people who are suppo supposed to handle the money. But in the process, you know, envelopes were thrown off, prayer requests were thrown off, money was collected. And this came out in the news media. It, 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 
it, it had such a big impact on the ministry. The minis whole ministry collapsed. Whole ministry. The church was shut. Uh, it, it, was, it was so tragic. Was Larry Lee directly responsible for this? From my understanding, no. It was people in the organization who were collecting the offering and handling the money were, were responsible. But one, but this, something like this ended the whole church. Finished, gone. And, uh, you know, Larry Lee himself went into depression. And so it was very sad what all happened after that. But it was just the way my offering was collected and the way it was being processed. Uh, it was shown on television, finished. So people, you know, were saying, like, what's happening? But as a ministry, he was so powerful. Uh, he was doing such a wonderful ministry across America, leading the cities in prayer. You know, he would have these prayer rallies and the whole stadiums would be filled with people coming to pray. But just this one thing that had to do with the way money was being collected and processed destroyed the whole ministry. Uh, it destroyed his marriage. He went into depression. Uh, you know, it was very sad anyway. But, you know, I'm just giving a simple example. And it, this was a high profile because his ministry was so big and he was doing so wonderful, you know. So just this, this mismanagement of money. Uh, another example I can think of, I'll just talk, just give you a few stories, was that of Yonggi Cho. Now, uh, we did, uh, and uh, uh, Yonggi Cho is, uh, is known of, uh, is, is, he, you know, he just passed away a couple of weeks back uh, at a good old age of 80 something, 80, I forget what his age was, 80 plus. But he began his ministry back in the 1960s, had, you know, the world's largest church, uh, over 850,000 people. Uh, in Seoul, Korea, and uh, you know, it was a pioneer in many ways. Introduced uh, the whole idea of uh, cell groups to the church, the church growth movement, so many things. So tremendous blessing. It uh, it caused you know uh, large churches to rise up in Korea, and 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 he had a you know he had a wonderful ministry for decades, decades, wonderful ministry. And now, you know, this happened just, I think, the uh, yeah, early part of this decade, I think. I'm not exactly sure about the dates, but I think the early part of this decade. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, not this decade, but somewhere in uh, between 2011 and 2010, just some maybe five, six years back. Um, so, you know, almost you could say about six decades from, you know, 1960 up to or five plus decades uh, up to about 2010, flawless ministry, meaning nobody could find a fault. He was a minister, grew so many, so many things they were doing in Korea, amazing. And of course, he was also getting old, older in age. So he had a wonderful ministry, no fault, nothing. But suddenly, about five, six years ago, and he was by this time, he was, you know, in his seventies. He was kind of retired. He was still preaching, but in the state of you know, retiring, retired elderly person. And at that age, news broke out that his sons, his or one of his sons, one of his sons had in some way misappropriated some funds of the church. Now, you're talking about Yonggi Cho. He's now in his 70s. 50 plus years of solid ministry, no fault, wonderful ministry, in his, you know, like late 70s, something like this is happening. And it sent the news spread across the Christian world because this is like a very prominent, very powerful, influential Christian church ministry and a Christian leader. And, uh, you know, there was this whole thing about 
some funds, and a large amount of money from the church was misused by his son. And Yonggi Cho was in trouble because, uh, or his name was there because he signed the documents. And, uh, and Yonggi Cho, you know, I, I felt very bad for him because he was so elderly. And at this age, stage in life, this thing is coming out. And he was responsible because he signed the documents. And now I don't know, you know, I don't know the details, so I'm not trying to defend him or anything. But basically, he said was, you know, he said, look, I signed the documents. I did, you know, like I said, I regularly signed documents. I didn't know this was happening. So I don't, you know, I don't know whether he was actually aware or not aware or was it a genuine mistake? I don't know. But what I felt so bad was he was a great man of God who for decades had served so faithfully. Here now in his late 70s, a financial scandal or thing has broken out and he was supposed to go to jail. You know, so the, all the, the whole case was charged, everything, and they said he has to spend at least two years in jail, two or three years or some, whatever that sentence was. But they, on humanitarian grounds, because of his age and all of that, they said no. You know, they, 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 they kind of uh, made some changes for it because he had served so much and he was elderly, etc., and things like that. So the, the actual sentence was lessened and changed, modified. But the point is this. Something went wrong, whether Yongich was aware or not, I don't know, we don't know all the details, but an otherwise flawless, wonderful ministry was tarnished towards the end of his stage. And he died, you know, like I said, a few weeks back, towards the end of his, it was so sad to read about that. And, you know, whatever the crown realities was, the fact is, this happened. And whether Yonggi Cho himself knew it or not, he was the senior pastor. Whether he was aware that was happening, he was a senior pastor and he was sentenced to jail. Right? But on humanitarian grounds, they, they lessened it or re removed it or whatever. But it was really sad. So just another example where mismanagement of money, something went wrong, it brings disrepute to the Christian ministry. And like this, you know, there are just numerous cases. And right here in India, there are shocking stories of Christian churches, large Christian organizations where money is not managed and things happen. And, and it's very, very sad, you yeah. Uh, so the, these kinds of stories are just almost, you know, every year you run into these kinds of things. You hear about high profile ministries, you hear about smaller churches, ministries, money is mismanaged, churches get into trouble, Christian leaders get into trouble uh, because of money being mismanaged, you know. And uh, so I just want to share one more story. One of the things that really shocked me was uh, this happened somewhere between 2008 to 2010. I, I forget the exact year, but, you know, at that time, there were several churches in Bangalore. Uh, we had all, we had come together and uh, to do, certain, do some work together. And uh, uh, we had a common uh, entity that was formed where you know we would all contribute money to and then whatever project needed to be carried out would be carried out with those common funds and I still remember at that time uh, that you know when when things were very active uh, in, 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 with this uh, they said okay we need to raise up some money to do a certain project and I think it was to help rebuild some churches that were destroyed um, that had been destroyed. So at that time, from APC, I said, we will give 1 lakh rupees, 100,000 rupees for this, towards this. So we contributed from APC, we gave 1 lakh. 
So I know I'm not sure what the other churches gave, whatever. So the money was collected in this common fund. And then uh, for whatever reason, that money was not used, the, the, the project didn't happen, you know. And uh, so then after some time, they said, okay, see, we haven't executed the project. Uh, so we will return the money back to the people, the churches who gave it. Fine. Uh, so I got a call from this person who was handling the money, the finances in that common organization entity. He called me and he asked me, so this 100,000 rupees, uh, we are returning it back. Do you want the check in your name or in the name of the church? That was a question he was asking me. You know, I, my, I was actually shocked that he was even asking me that question. And my answer was like, I didn't even have to think. I said, the money came from the church. It has to go back to the church. The check has to be in the name of the church. Thank you. That was it. My answer it was a very quick, finished thing. But after the call, I started thinking, what kind of a question he even asked me? Do you want the check in your name or in the name of the church? What kind of a question is that? You know, it really shocked me. I mean, it kind of, I was, you know, at that moment I just reacted. I said, money came from the church. I was go back to the church, put it in the, you know, the check has to be the name of the church, finished, bye. But after that, you know, I said, oh, I was actually shocked. And then I began to think, you know, I wonder what's happening with, and, and I'm not trying to pass judgment, but what if a pastor who was in my place said, yeah, 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 put the check in my name. That money would have gone, right? It came from the church, went to this common entity, had to be returned. And this person who's handling the accounts there is asking the pastor, Whose name do you want to check? It, it's that question should not have even been asked. But I was just suddenly thinking after the call, what kind of a question is asking me? And what if some pastor had said, "Yeah, just put it in my name." That money would have disappeared. But I'm just sharing this because when it comes to money, you don't know where the opportunities come from for mishandling it. And it may seem very, what to say, um, innocuous. It may seem very harmless at that moment. But if we compromise, at some point, it's going to come out and it will be very destructive. So the only choice we have is to be 100% honest, 100% integrity in the handling of money. That's the only safe way, right? But there are challenges. The challenge is, as a pastor, you're not the one handling the money. The money is being handled by your accounting team. So it becomes very scary because it's a matter of trust. I hope they are handling it right. Because if they make a mistake, they may not suffer. The pastor and the church will suffer. If they mishandle money in some way, the only person who's going to get a bad name, nobody will know the name of the accountant. Everybody will know the name of the pastor and the name of the church and they will point fingers. So it's actually a very, very, very scary situation in, hand, in this whole thing of church and Christian ministry. How, but there are solutions, of course. There's a way in which you set up things in the administration so that it's very tight that the, the chances of mishandling, the chances of mi mismanagement should be zero. So we are going to learn that next week, uh, in the next lecture, uh, the next maybe next two lectures. How do we set things up so tight 
as far as money is concerned, that there will be zero error so that the church and the ministry and of course the pastor and the pastoral team are protected. Because like I said, anything goes wrong, the only person who's going to get into trouble is the, the pastor and the team, you know, because nobody's going to catch the accountant or the people who are actually handling the money. They're going to point fingers at the pastor. So that's very important. But today, I just want to give a little biblical perspective of things uh, as far as ministry, finances, ministry, church and ministry finances, just a little biblical perspective. Then next lecture on, we get into the practical side of things. Okay. So what I've done now is just to share a little couple of stories. And like this, there are so many stories where uh, money, uh, church and ministry money has to be handled with utmost care, uh, with utmost detail, so that uh, nothing goes wrong. So I want to place before us three simple uh, biblical things. Uh, and we see this in scripture and uh, I will show you uh, some of the, we will look at some of the scriptures. The first thing is this, that, uh, that the, the work of God, the work that God wants done, right? God has, God has uh, designed it that Every God-given vision, the provision comes through God's people. Right? So God will provide for a God-given vision. So he gives the vision for something to be done. And then God will provide for that vision. And it usually happens through God's people. I say usually because sometimes there are exceptions when God will provide for a vision he's given through even the unbelievers sometimes. But the normal, normal thing is God gives a vision and he brings provision for it through God's people. It's, it's a biblical thing. And some examples I'd say, for example, you see, uh, if you see in the Old Testament, in Exodus 12, God told Moses, Moses, I want you to build a tabernacle. Uh, I'll tell you how to design it. But tell the people to bring an offering. Tell each one to come and give, you know, things of gold, things to make the curtains, the ornaments, the jewels. Tell the people to bring it. So Moses goes in front of the people. This is in the 12th chapter of Exodus. And he tells the people, hey, God has said we have to build him a tabernacle. Uh, those who want to give, please give. And the people brought. They brought whatever they had, they had from Egypt. They brought their gold, their silver, their, you know, the materials to make the curtains, everything. The people brought and gave. And so the tabernacle was built. Then, you know, when they came into the land of Israel, and uh, one of the things that God instituted was, okay, people, you bring the tithe of the produce of your land. So he set up the priesthood. You know, there were priests and the Levites who would take care of the temple and all that. Then he told the people, people, uh, you bring your tithe, the tithe of your produce, you know, of your animals, of your cattle, of your, the produce of your ground. You bring it to the temple and uh, the priests, the Levites will live out of that. And... Uh, uh, you people bring the offering. A part of it is burnt as an offering to the Lord, and there's part that is eaten, that is given to the priests and their households for them to live on. So God set it up in the Old Testament. So this was a pattern that here are these people who are serving in spiritual things, and they would be cared for by the offerings and the tithes which the people bring and give it in the temple. So God set it up, a vision from God, provision comes through the people. Same thing when uh, David had in his heart, this is in First Chronicles, the 29th chapter. I'm just giving this story, just mentioning it and I'm not gonna read it. In First Chronicles 29, 
when you know God put in David's heart to prepare to build the temple, uh, David just told the people. He said, "Hey, uh, this is the temple we are going to build. This is the design I have. Those of you who want to give, give." And the people brought until it was so much that they said, "Okay, we have more than enough." You know, so people brought, and with that, Solomon built the temple. So. You come into the New Testament, you see the ministry of Jesus. He was a traveling minister. He traveled from place to place and people gave. So the gospel records, you know, there were people who took care of the needs of Jesus and his team. Uh, and they gave to, the, uh, to him and his team. Uh, the apostles, as they traveled, uh, you know, people helped them financially. And so Paul uh, in his epistles to the Corinthians talks about money and he says, you know, that uh, those who preach the gospel, they live off the gospel. This is what God has ordained. First, and this is in First Corinthians 9. And, uh, and, and he also says that, you know, uh, those who are taught in spiritual things, you give in material things to the people who minister to you. So this is something God has set up even in the New Testament. So, that's the first thing, right? that God has set this up where when he gives a vision, the provision comes through his people. Now, there are exemptions, except exceptions, like, for example, in the case of Nehemiah, you know, God had put in his heart to go and rebuild the walls of the city of Jerusalem. And there the provision came through the Persian king. Uh, so, uh, you know, the... Mm, Persian king said, okay, whatever Nehemiah wants, let him have it. So, you know, there are times when God will bring the provision in through people other than his own people, then that's fine. But the normal is God's people give towards the vision. The second spiritual principle that we see in scripture is that we must serve people spiritually, then they will sow materially, right? So that's again a spiritual principle that we see uh, in the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. So how do we get funds for ministry? Simple. You serve the people spiritually, then they will sow financially. That's the arrangement God has made. Those who preach the gospel, live off the gospel. Those who are ministered to in spiritual things, they will give back in material things. Galatians 6 also says that. Okay, So that is the second biblical principle as far as money is concerned. right? So today I'm just covering the biblical principles. Um, next class we'll get into all the practical side. All right? So this is what God has uh, put, in, put for his people. Right? So our goal is, look, let's do the best we can to spiritually serve the people. And if we do that well, then God will put it in their hearts to give back materially, to give back financially, so that you know our, our needs will be taken care of, and then we can do all the work of the ministry that God wants us to do. Second principle. Third Principle is this, Jesus taught. This is in Luke, the 16th chapter. He's, he taught us that being a good steward of money is important to being a good steward of spiritual things. So I just want us to look at that verse because sometimes uh, we don't, uh, pay attention to this. So let's just go to Luke 16. Uh, and uh, so this is the parable of the unjust steward. And we just read the last part of uh, the parable. Uh, Luke 16, uh, we'll read verses 10 to 12, please. Luke 16, 10 to 12. Can uh, somebody read that for us? Luke 16, 10 to 12. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. 
and he who is unjust in what is least is unjust in much, also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust, your trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in what is another, another man's, who will give you what is your own? Mm. No, sir. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, um, what is Jesus teaching us? Right. Verse ten, he says, "You be faithful in what is least, because if you are faithful in what is least, you'll also be faithful in what is lot." So that's a very important principle. So when you, when you and I have little money, and the whole context is money, Luke sixteen, right? Uh, this parable here. When you're faithful, little amounts of money, if you're faithful in that, God will entrust to you much more. So, when there's little money, be faithful. And I remember, you know, those early days in ministry, sometimes somebody used to, you know, this was like in my teenage years and early 20s, people used to give me offering 100 rupees, 200 rupees. That used to be offering those days. But I said, God, it's only 100 rupees. I'll be faithful and I'll take, make sure I use this right. I'll write down my accounts, keep it. And uh, I will make sure I tithe out of that 100 rupees that people gave, make sure I use the rest of the money carefully. So there was a time when Offerings was very small, you know, small amounts, which when we look at it today was small amounts. But I said, I will treat it, with, I will treat it with honor. I'll treat this amount, even if it's a small amount, I'll treat it with honor, I'll treat it with respect. Because I remember this parable. Jesus said, if you are faithful in little, then you will be given, you'll be faithful in much. And I say, I those I say, I say, God, I'll be faithful in this, but one day I know you'll give me lots of money to handle. For the ministry, you know. So when there were small amounts, just be faithful. Treat it as you would treat large amounts, you know. and then God will bless you. The second thing, notice He says in verse eleven, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? So in verse eleven, Jesus is somehow equating handling money. To handling spiritual things. He's saying, if you cannot handle money properly, who's going to commit to you the true riches, meaning the real things of the kingdom? Who will entrust you with spiritual things? So somehow here he's connecting this. Look, if you handle money carefully, I know I can trust you with handling the things of the kingdom. Now, many of us don't see this connection. We think, oh, money, forget it. I will only be handling spiritual things. Oh, that is good. But Jesus connected the two. That for us, in, in order to be entrusted with handling true riches, spiritual things, show your faithfulness by handling money. That's in verse 11, Luke 16, 11. Right? Then in Luke 16, 12, he says, if you're not faithful to somebody else's, how can you have your own? Right. So when you're handling money on behalf of somebody else, be faithful. Then God will trust you with your own. Right. So this is the third uh, biblical principle I want to put forward, which is if we are a good steward of money, then God will also help us be steward of spiritual things. This is based on Luke 16, 11. So first, first biblical principle is provision that God gives, he will bring provision through his people, normal, normal way. Second biblical principle is if we sow spiritually into the lives of people, then God will help them to give or God will move them to give financially. Third biblical principle is if I'm, I need to be a good steward of money, 
just like how I'm being a good steward or I want to be a good steward of spiritual things. These are not separate things. These go together according to Luke 16, 11. Fourth thing that uh, the Bible teaches us, the principle concerning money is, we must be accountable to the people who have given the money. And uh, I just want to reference one scripture. This is from 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 20 and 21. Can somebody read that? 2 Corinthians 8, 20 and 21. Second Corinthians 8, 20 and 21, please. Somebody. Avoiding this, that anyone should blame us in this lavish gift, which is administered by us, providing honorable things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. So, you know, Paul here is actually, you know, we just picked out two verses, but Paul is, you know, coordinating collection of money, uh, from the Corinthian believers and this money has to go to Jerusalem to help the people the church in Jerusalem So he's basically just coordinating all this But as he's coordinating this he's saying look um, I want to make sure that Nobody can be able nobody should be able to blame us That's verse 20 Avoiding this that anyone should blame us in this lavish gift that is administered by us that means look we are collecting this money you know he's expecting a lot of money but nobody should be able to find fault with us and verse 21 we want to provide honorable things not only in the sight of the lord but also in the sight of men that means and how we handle the money uh, we want to be honorable not only in god's eyes but also in man's eyes you know, I remember uh, City Harvest Church in uh, Singapore. I think that's the name of the church. Uh, Pastor Kong He and his wife, uh, son. So, you know, again, there's a wonderful church that uh, that was coming up, uh, that became very prominent, very influential. It became a very big church with uh, many thousands of young people attending, all of that. Wonderful. So this was, you know, the last um, 20 years or so. But then problems happen. Um, and again, I don't, I don't want to go into all the details, but just, just to give a little idea what happened. So Pastor Kong, his wife, Reverend Sun, uh, she was a worship pastor, worship leader there in the church, all of that, wonderful. She was herself was an ordained pastor, but at some point she felt that uh, she should take her singing talent abilities along with lots of people in the church to sing music that would appeal to people outside the church. So it was, you know, going out into reaching people, which is which is fine. I'm not, I'm not against that. So she did songs that would reach people in China. Uh, then she wanted to. You know, she moved to the U.S. To wanting to be uh, uh, on the whatever you know uh, the the music um, scene there, all of it. But the problem was, in order to pursue this, uh, from the information that was available, uh, a lot of the church money was funding this work. That means it's almost like church money was being used to fund her personal music career, although in the early stages it was stated that the her personal music career was a way to reach people with the gospel, but the songs were just neutral songs. It wasn't like gospel songs or Christian songs. So that became a big question. Now, you know, 
they were since uh, uh, you know my feel again you know i'm not passing judgment or anything or i'm not i don't know all the details but my feel is they were sincere people they sincerely wanted to bring kingdom influence outside the church in the music field but somehow they made mistake right? they were sincere but this area just blurred where money given to the church was being used to fund this this music career and that 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 caused a lot of problems there's a lot of you know thing in the news and so on and so forth and anyway things uh, to thank god that you know the church stood by them and was faithful you know and uh, helped them through it and uh, i think things have been resolved or I, i'm not sure what what state it is in but the point is this that gives us brings us to the fourth biblical principle we must be accountable to the people who have given the money just because they've given the money doesn't give us the license to do whatever we feel like with the money can't do that they've given the money but in the back of our minds we must say look whatever i do with this money i must be able to answer back to the people i must be answerable or accountable to the people who gave if they ask what did you do with it with a clear with a clear heart clear and clean hands i should be able to say look this is where we used the money this is what uh, it was given for and that's how it has been used everything clean so paul wrote here in verse 21 we must be honorable not only in the sight of the lord but also in the sight of men so that's the fourth principle and one last one we must also be accountable to civic authorities that means government so just because we are uh, you know uh, main, receiving money to do church work or ministry work doesn't mean we are not accountable to the civil government no we are accountable we have to follow the rules uh do or uh, to the uh, you know, follow the rules and whatever is required so here again uh, and i can speak of what happens here in india um uh, there's there are a lot of problems because uh, churches christian organizations uh, you know we we don't follow the rules and the government then comes and checks you know, and then we say we call it persecution. No, it's not persecution. The government is doing their job. And we fail to do our job in filing uh, with the government the required uh, filings that need to be made every year uh, regularly. And when we fail to do it, then the government obviously will have to come and investigate what's happening. Where is the money coming from? Where is it going? What is it being used to used for? And um, they, they come to investigate, you know, obviously when there's something suspicious, when there's something uh, that has not been reported, uh, and that's why they come in to check. Then we say, oh, the government is persecuting us. They're not persecuting. Because if we had filed everything, then we can, you know, we can respond with, with confidence and say, okay, here, here are the papers, here are all the documents, here are all the accounts, everything is fine. Uh, you know, especially in the, in the last several years, recent years, so many organizations, Christian organizations also had to shut down, uh, not because government is intentionally persecuting. Well, they may have some agenda at the back, but there was a reason why they could do it. If we had not given them a reason uh, of filing things on time, keeping the accounts the way they're supposed to be, then even if they come to ask questions, we can provide the answers. But when we are unable to answer, then uh, we are at fault and we can't call it persecution. So that's the last point I want to mention here, which is we have to be accountable to civic authorities financially, right? So quickly to recap the five, five principles. One is, you know, when God gives a vision, he will bring provision through his people. 
second we serve people spiritually they will provide they will share financially third being a good steward of money is equally important to being a good steward of spiritual things fourth we must be accountable to the people who have given us the money to use and lastly we must also be accountable to civic authorities now for all of this there is scripture and I've, i will put it in the notes that i'll give you next class um, it's there and i think all of us know that uh, you know this is what the bible teaches us but uh, so um you know uh, okay i'm seeing a question so does a believer have the right to ask how it's used like in a genuine way yes Right. So that's a policy we follow here at All People's Church. Uh, um, one is uh, our audited financial accounts are on our website. Uh, so we actually put it out for people to see. That means you know we have a, our web page, uh, apcwo.org slash financials. So right from 2001, uh, every year, uh, we tell our accountants once they have audited everything, it's been audited by a independent organization as well. Uh, the final things are published on our website. Plus, we state that any member of our church, APC, uh, has the freedom to ask any question about the money. They can send an email to our accountant and uh, uh, we will respond. Right. So they have the right to ask because they've given the money. And uh, now, of course, they they don't have the right to ask of how much somebody else is giving. No, it's, you know, this is what you've given. We can tell you what's happened or how the money is being used and so on. But that, yes, they have the right to ask. And we should be answerable to people who've contributed. Okay, that's the way we operate. Uh, and, uh, yeah, that's, that's how it is. Okay, so we'll get into the practical side of how to do it over the next couple of lectures. But today was more of, look, you know, this is what we have seen happening in the Christian world. Uh, there are just so many examples of uh, problems happening. Uh, we have to be very careful. And these are the biblical principles we should keep in mind as we handle the money for the church or the Christian ministry. And uh, it takes a lot of effort to make sure that things are kept properly but uh, we have no other alternative but to handle things properly but there are good rewards i mean if you handle it well you know uh, people will trust us more uh, and uh, we can also uh, be you know have a clean heart uh, peaceful mind as we do this thing all right, so we'll pause here for today. We are going to continue this uh, on uh, Friday and maybe we'll do, you know, how, how many lectures we need to cover this uh, properly. Could somebody just please, uh, are there any questions? Sorry, uh, I know Siddharth asked this question. Anybody else has any questions? Okay, and uh, when we get into the actual practical side, uh, you know, you're. I'm sure you'll have questions then. Let's pray and we will dismiss. Can somebody just pray with us and dismiss us, please? Yes, sir. Father God, we just come before once again, you strong Father God. Father God, give to you wisdom and knowledge, Father God, that we can like uh, maintain the money side, Father God. This is very important side, Father God. Give you uh, give the maintain the, the money side, Father God, and the integrity we will maintain, Father God. And we can keep the nicely, Father God, and we can maintain and take the clean heart father god and also father god help us to uh the move to your kingdom work with the money side father god father god uh give your fully uh understanding and wisdom and knowledge father god they can we can use father god the money side father god to nicely to your kingdom work father god father god uh we can maintain the accountability father god to in front you and in, in front of your people father god to help to move the money side father god father god thanking you the class father god thanking you the subject father god thanking you sir and all subject all the students father god father god I, upcoming time i'm just submitting to your hand take care of everything father god thanking you thanking you father god 
Almighty Jesus name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. See you again soon. God Thank bless. You, Bye now. Bye now.